And he joins us now. Great to see you, Mike. Good to see so you. So you've, you've sent a series of letters to presidents, to this president, <laughs> to the president before. Sure. And they basically have the same gist. The problem has been unresolved. What's the core problem? Well, the core problem is nobody really knows how to talk about the skills gap, yeah. in my opinion, because there's a, um, you know, there, there's a belief and a narrative in the country that says we can cure unemployment by creating more opportunity. Right. And obviously there's some truth to it, but the skills gap has nothing to do with unemployment, not really. The, the skills gap proves that opportunity alone isn't enough to get people un, unemployed. Right. Right. And, and really neither is training. You can have all the opportunity and all the training in the world, but if you don't have an underlying appreciation for the work, if you're not talking about jobs that people affirmatively aspire to, you're going to be pushing the the boulder up the hill or tilting at the windmill or whatever self-defeating metaphor makes the most sense to you. It's a, it's a sucker's bet. You have to be talking about jobs that are uniformly uh, cared about in order to move the needle. So you can have a job available, but if no one can do it, the job remains unfilled. 5.6 million jobs exist right now as we're talking. 5.6 million jobs, 75% of which don't require a four-year degree. When people talk about you know, why the skills gap exists, it's it's almost, how can it not exist? We took Votech out of high school. At the same time, we told an entire generation that their best hope for success was a four-year degree. Right. So the most expensive path becomes the best path for the most people. At the same time, all these other jobs, which are linked to this very fundamental form of education, are completely marginalized because we sent a really powerful message. You know, you, you don't just take vocational technical training out of high schools and that be the end of it. That sets all kinds of dominoes in place and none of them are pretty and they all fall down. So I hate to be political, but we are in Washington. These things don't happen without forces moving them to happen. There's a massive lobby fielded by the four-year education industry. Do you think that has something to do with it? Oh God, look, okay. The skills gap isn't a mystery because it's a reflection of what we value. The cost of college isn't a mystery, I, I believe, for the same reasons. You know, yeah, there's a lobby, but it's not just the Washington lobby. It's parents who very rationally want something better for their kids than right. they had. What does that mean? We've got to figure it out. But they're guidance counselors on the front line who are incentivized to push kids toward college as well. So guidance counselors too often don't talk about the alternative careers, which, by the way, fun word, right? Higher education over here alternative education over here if you're not cut out for this. So in a thousand ways, we give kids dozens of, of, of cues and clues as, yes. to, as to what success looks like. As a result, the jobs we're talking about today on the Hill, these are important jobs that just haven't been celebrated. That's why they're going begging. So regarding student loans, yeah, $1.3 trillion is a lot of money to hold, but we made an unlimited pile of money available. We told everybody that the best path for the most people was a four-year degree, and well, of course, they borrowed until they borrowed no more, and colleges compete with each other, so the price goes up faster, faster than real estate, faster than food, faster than energy, faster than health care, never before in the history of Western civilization has anything so important become so expensive so quickly. Yeah, and much faster than inflation. What we haven't done is readjusted our expectations based on reality. So we have a, a pretty illustrative graphic here. <laughs> so we have on the one side a letter that you sent to President Obama uh -huh. outlining these problems. Mm -hmm. Here's the letter that you sent to President Trump, and you basically scratched out the name of the president and sent the same letter. <laughs> so I was literally driving down here yesterday, and I, I found this old letter. I did exactly as you said, and I wrote a little thing on Facebook just telling my friends where I was going and why. I got here, uh, it's been shared 18,000 times, it's reached four million people. People wanna talk about this, but look, the truth is that's, I, I don't know what else to do. I mean, I came here in 2001, testified to the Committee of Transportation, Science and Commerce. Came back in 2013, testified to the Senate Committee of Natural Resources. Came yes. back today, talked to uh, education and the workforce. I, what are you going to do? You know, like a, that's what I mean. We're a lot of good people are pushing the boulder up the hill. Yes. But until and unless we change, I hate to sound like I'm, I'm running for something. I'm not. But you're talking about hearts and minds of guidance counselors that's and right. parents. So we can do and say all kinds of things on the hill. 
And the, and the Perkins Act is important. I hope it gets through this time. It looks like it might. But regardless, the, the real wet work happens around the kitchen table. And if it's not a, if it's not a topic of conversation, that 5.6 million number is going to be twice as big in, in, in five years. Because five years ago, it was 2.5. Exactly. So it's just math. So here's the, the last question. Do you think that we value as a society work in the way that we once did? Maybe that's part of the problem. At the risk of being glib, I would say if you really want to make America great again, you got to make work cool again. Yes. And I know that sounds a little high schooly, but look, that's where the action is. We get there's a long list of stuff we can't control, but it is completely in our power to decide what the definition of a good job is. That's up to us, right? So if if we disparage and malign an entire category of perfectly reasonable opportunities, then it's not the out of work worker who's going to pay the ultimate price. It's people like you and me who are addicted to smooth roads, affordable energy, indoor plumbing, and all that stuff. That's right. I don't think it's a glib answer at all. I think it's deep. It's not bad. You know, if a, it, it really isn't bad. If you want to make the country great again, you got to make work cool. I think, I think that's right. And work confers dignity. I mean, that's the best part about it. I kind of feel like I should look into a camera and say that with all the. <laughs> with all the earnestness I can muster. If you want to make America great again, you've got to make work cool again. Mike Rowe, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Up next, Democrats obviously don't care for President Trump's agenda, but is he even causing them to reject patriotism and common sense? Based on last night, that's an open question. We'll talk to a Democrat who thinks his speech was closer to something a fascist would give than an American. That's up 